Welcome to Hide and Create, your online writing workshop. I should have started drinking before I logged on. <laughs> Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. <laughs> you know what? I'm already lost. That's your thing, Jordan. You're all, wow. You say yeah. something and you go, right? <laughs> Is this being recorded? Magic mice creatures. I should have thought of that. Screw <laughs> it! See, I knew I set myself up. You guys have been passing the joint around while I was going at it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you for being ridiculous there. I could put that in the intro. <laughs> Welcome back to Hide and Create. Today we're going to talk about creating tension in your writing. I am joined by Jordan Ellinger, Joshua Esso, and Jay Wells. Uh, we do have an editor on the line with us, Joshua Esso, so I figure you're a good person to go to first as we talk about this subject. All right. Well... I think the thing to keep in mind is when you're creating tension that what you're doing is you're creating emotional beats. That's what creates tension. Every time you create an emotional experience for your reader, it doesn't matter what kind, it's an emotional beat that is involving your reader in your story and hoping them make them feel things. And when they feel things, that means they're connected. When they're connected, that means that they have the potential to feel tension for whatever problem is going on with your protagonist. Or even your antagonist, depending on you know your writing style and if you're switching back and forth between viewpoints. Um... I think that that is actually a uh, a good point. It's a really good way to create tension if you're switching back and forth between a protagonist and an antagonist viewpoint because then you're giving your readers basically a ringside seat to the action. Uh, they can see the, inve- the inevitable collision between the forces coming and they can start to feel the consequences of those conflicts from, from a long way off. They can start anticipating um, in a way, it's like uh, it's like letting your readers do a lot of the heavy lifting for you because in their imagination, they're thinking about what will happen when the good guy and the bad guy collide. They're amping up their own emotional reactions as they start to anticipate. Yeah, that really that that is actually a very good point. Is you can let your readership have more information than your protagonist, right? And that is that that is a huge way of developing tension because the protagonist will do things that are unexpected to the audience, right? Because because they don't know all the information that the audience has. So they'll go into that basement, right, thinking it's just a burnt out light when when the audience knows that there's, you know, the man in this hockey mask or something down there, right? So that's that's how um a lot of horror novels work, right? Because the horror is in the reader knowing that the protagonist is doing something that could end their lives. Yeah. Yeah, you don't ever go to the basement alone. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a basement. I don't have to worry about that problem. <laughs> the attic uh, is trouble. <laughs> I, I, like, I like what you're saying about uh, creating those emotional beats. Do, does everyone uh, agree with that? Do you have any thoughts on that? For tie-ins, that's not necessary. Sorry, Jay, I'm just going to cut in with the tie-in that's thing. Okay. Yeah, with tie-ins, uh, especially you know, like Warhammer... Um, the, well, I guess the emotion there would be uh, excitement, right? It's not necessarily like um, uh, sadness or attach- attachment to the main character. Sometimes if you just write a cool action scene where, you know, the dwarf leaps off a tower, uh, falls 30 feet and cleaves his axe through the skull of the barbarian, right? That's, I mean, I guess the emotional connection there is, is like I said, excitement. You don't need to, you know, tension is will somebody live as opposed to um, will things resolve well for the protagonist what were you going to say Jay? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, there are so many different layers of the story that work together to create tension. It's not just about, um, like, the actual action of the scene. It's how you craft the scene. Um, when you come into the scene, when you get out of the scene can create tension. Like, if, you're, if you don't give... Um, people all the information up front they're kind of figuring out what's going on as the as the action's playing out and then ending the scene at a point of high tension can really up the pace of your story um also just down on kind of more of a micro level just how you structure your sentences can increase tension you know if you're if you've got a lot of tension you don't necessarily want to write big long flowery um sentences with lots of clauses and things like that you know if you want to you want you can use the structure of your sentences to 
you know, be shorter and, and crisper and things like that. And so you really can work tension on several levels in one scene to really up the stakes. That's a great point. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you said that. It's, it's, it's a really good tool to use the way that you structure your sentences and your words and stuff like that. Short, punchy sentences, a lot of them in a row, uh, has the unique ability to create a staccato in the reading that makes your reader feel like things are happening at a certain pace and that really does help with your attention or with your action scenes and stuff like that. I said, and also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, Jay. Oh, I was going to say in dialogue as well, you know, one of the problems that a lot of new writers fall into and one of the things that experienced writers are called out on by their editors a lot is writing dialogue that's too on the nose. Mm -hmm. It can really increase tension if characters aren't saying exactly what they think when they aren't, you know, they're leaving information out. And that kind of ties into what you were saying earlier about, you know, the the reader knows things that maybe the characters don't know. And you can really play with that in dialogue. You don't want people, you know, people don't really talk that way. We withhold information and we don't say exactly how we're feeling all the time. And so you can really use, you know, dialogue, especially if you're talking about like an argument um, or, you know, when the protagonist and the antagonist are talking and you can, they aren't like, I hate you, well, I hate you. Well, make it, you know, use use the way that they're talking to ramp up the tension. Like, focus on what's not being said, I guess is really what I'm saying. Yeah, like what, um, what Jay was saying about the, you know, long versus short sentences. Like, I was going to mention that too, and, and also an add-on to that was that if you're in a in deep point of view, whether you're a first person or a third person, you know, you're in the head of that character. So if, if the whole way that you're writing changes, not just, uh, you know, in, in addition to shorter sentences and so on, a shorter paragraph, shorter sentences, um, you know, maybe you're, you're breaking off more sentences with, you know, with an M dash mid, mid, mid thought, like, you, you know, you use all your, all your, um, tricks in your bag, but, but also, you know, the, the thoughts of that character, you know, are, are going to change and the way you write that scene should change to show, to, to, to kind of let the reader soak up all of that tension. And, um, you know, th- there's two ways to do typically an internal monologue. I mean, you can, you can italicize it and have like a separate thought, which I, I think, that. oh my goodness, I hate that. I, it yeah. takes me right out of the novel, which well, I, that's I, interesting. Which, huh. I, which I, which I like to do in moderation if it's, if it's a, a thought that really is exactly what would occur in their mind. And it's, it's hard to find those moments because like our own internal thoughts are not, they're not always like literal. They're not always spelled out, but I think sometimes you can do that effectively. But a lot of times I think when you're creating tension, the, the other approach is better, which is where the whole narrative stream takes on the entire point of view of the character. And then there can be a sentence in the middle of, what you're saying, such as, uh, you know, blah, 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 that would be just like her, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, the, the, the line blurs between the character's thoughts and the perception of what's going on, the description of what's going on, and the action and the dialogue. And it's, you know, it's a way of injecting that character's tension into the narrative. And so that's another kind of like, you know, smaller level technique. Let me, let me talk for a second I, um, about the italicized uh, thought thing. Um, it, it, listeners of the show will, will know that I have fairly strong opinions about how, how to write in general, and it's not necessarily for everybody. But the reason I don't like that is because italicized thoughts can almost always be shown better. I mean, that's a tell for sure. You're, you're outright telling people what your character is thinking word for word, right? You can usually have them take an action or speak in dialogue and portray the same thing far more effectively. So, you know, if you want to use that trick in your toolbox, then, then, then sure do. But just try to think about next time, is there a way that I can show this as opposed to telling it? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, so I, I don't think show is necessarily better than tell. I think, like, yes, in general, we lean towards show versus tell. But sometimes a quick tell is more effective than all this elaborate trying to show something that you want the reader to know in two words or, you know, something like that. Fair enough. Like, yeah. Sure. Sometimes passive voice like, how, 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 is the best way to put something. It's your best tool to use in a certain situation. Um, like, like I don't know. Like, let's say a, an italicized thought, like liar. You know, like someone says something. Yeah. Liar. Liar. Okay. Like, Good point. 
you know, like you, you didn't have to go to any elaborate thing. You know what the character's thinking. You keep going. I don't know. Like you, that, there may be times for that. No, I agree. Actually, I, I, I'm, I agree with Jordan that if you can show rather than um, tell, then generally that's the best way to go. But I am of the opinion that uh, italicized, uh, they're, they're called direct thoughts. I think that they're a perfectly acceptable tool. I know lots and lots of authors use them. Um, the thing that Moses was talking about where the, the thoughts and the feelings of the character are just sort of incorporated into the general overall narrative. Those are what I call, I don't know what anybody else calls them, I call them quasi-thoughts. And they're basically such a deep penetration on the character that you know what they're thinking and feeling as part of your narrative. Right, and a lot of a lot of people do that very, very effectively. Um, I think one thing Jordan is pointing out, or you know, revealing, is that there are readers who do not like internalized monologue. And I did find in my first book that I had, like, I'm thinking of one person in particular who really didn't like it. Actually, two who didn't like internalized monologue. And so, you know, I have learned to be as subtle as I possibly can be about that. Use it sparingly. And again, like, mm -hmm. one of the keys I learned was literally try to only use it when it's, like, exactly verbatim what would be in, in the head, which is not often going to be the case. You know, so it, it can easily be overdone. If you do use a italicized internal monologue, like, really rein it back, because you may have a tendency to overdo it. I think I did initially. Yeah, um, and a quick, a quick note about that. Um, if you're going to use it, then use it. Don't go ahead. Don't do halfway. Don't have a, uh, a present tense sentence that is basically them thinking but then not italicize it because it gets really confusing with tenses switching back and forth like that we'll make it clear that you are actually giving a thought from inside the character's head yeah be, be clear about it jay what, what did you think about josh's point about the importance of emotional beats in creating tension because I, I still think that was an interesting thing that he said I, mean, I, I think it's it's super important um one of the best um things I ever learned about writing was from a woman named Margie Lawson, who is a psychologist who teaches writers how to write with emotional impact, with oh, like ultimate psychological emotional impact. And what she says is one of the opportunities that a lot of writers miss is infusing their writing with visceral emotion. And this kind of ties into the showing versus telling as well, because you don't want to say, I was mad. Um, you want to show the character feeling mad. And one of the ways that you do that is by using um, the body's visceral response to emotion. So um, there are wonderful resources out there, um, emotional body language dictionaries and things like that, that can really help you write those in a fresh way instead of just saying, like, um, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up or, you know, my palms were sweaty or, you know, whatever. These are these are physical responses to emotion that we can't control. And if you can, in scenes of really high tension, if you can, you know, pepper a few of those in, you don't want to overdo it unless it's super duper high tension scene. But if you can pepper some of those in, it heightens the emotional um, experience that the reader is also having. Because I don't know about you guys, but I... I'm sure we've all had this experience where we're reading a book and you realize that your fate, you know, like your body is clinching with the action of the book because the writer is such a, a pro at really um, conveying that emotion and making you feel it as well. And one of the ways you do that is by showing your character experiencing the emotion too. Um, and so that's that's something that I really try and focus on and especially in the scenes like the turning point scenes or the ones where there's a fight or something like that you don't you don't want to just say you know he hit me it made me mad like feel the rage of the character um feel their sadness feel their happiness like all these things help ramp up the tension so a great example of that for me was stephen king and I knew you were going to bring up. Yeah, everybody knows I'm only a, a matter of time. Man, boy, right? But, <laughs> but the, the phrase that he used was um, his character was very angry and he felt his balls tightening, right? <laughs> and I was like, whoa, I've, I've literally never read that before, <laughs> right? Like that. Oh, that's it's awesome. shocking, right? Like it's shocking to read something like that. But as a man, you you do feel that sometimes when you're enraged or when you're angry or when you're stressed you do, do you do feel that you don't really think about it but it was it was it was so it was that kind of additional shock of, of reading that that you know reference to a body part you don't normally refer to that really helped me you know get the emotion of that character 
Well, and those are techniques that, you know, like newer writers, like when you're first starting out, you're focusing on learning, you know, story structure and character development and, you know, getting all these basics down. But after you've been doing it a while and you're wanting to kind of improve your craft and deepen it and give your writing more impact, you start bringing in these extra, you know, um, I don't know, like strategies or methods just to bring it up to the next level. You know, you know, you can read a a perfectly well-written scene, but once you start um, really tinkering with your sentence structure and your visceral emotion and, and ramping up the tension in a fresh way, you'll see this big jump. Um, I, I will tell you after I took that class with Margie, I, um, I've taken several of her classes. I, I turned in a book. It was uh, Silver Tongue Devil, the fourth book of my Sabina Kane series. And I had gone and done an immersion class with Margie where I really focused on infusing that book with all that stuff. And my editor was like, I don't know what you did, but there is a huge difference here. And so and, – and even an editor couldn't tell what I had done differently, but it was just that the emotional impact of, of focusing on that really made a big difference. This is uh, Margie Lawson? Uh-huh. Okay. I, I think I've seen her, uh, her courses, too. Yeah, she has classes online. She does a lot of uh, workshops in person and things like that. But um, she – and what I love about it is that she just talks about writing in a way that you don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And they're these advanced, you know, techniques that writers like Stephen King may use naturally. But – you know, it's that we need to study these things so that we can put them in our writing as well. So, Joshua, can we drop a link uh, to Margie's site on our website? Yeah. Cool. Um, I wanted to actually get back to um, the 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 length of the sentences that you use just for a second um, in order to create tension. For for me, I mean, one trick that I've I've seen used uh, by my friend Stephen Savile is he actually puts, Joshua, you were talking about using very short sentences, he puts them in new paragraphs. So he'll have, like, sometimes, right. like, eight short sentences in their own paragraphs, right? And that really kind of, it's like hitting, getting punched in the face with every one of those sentences, right? Just because it's so, you know, dramatic, because you, you pause, you know, with a new paragraph. Um, one trick... It, it's difficult to get that right. You know, it's really difficult. Right. So for me... And really easy to overuse. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Like, I, what I do is when I write a scene like that, I read it aloud, right? And I, I kind of... I, I, I think about the way I'm reading it. Am I reading it in a very fast, kind of excited manner? Or am I kind of stopping when I, when I verbally speak it out loud um, a lot? And, and so it's like I'm punching somebody in the face when I'm, when I'm reading it aloud, Right. Everybody, when they read, usually has, you know, like they, they read internally, you can hear the words. Sure, you form images as well, but on some basic level, y you are reading the words on the page, right? So if you speak them out loud as a writer, that will help you to kind of smooth off the rough edges and, and get the, the pacing that you want. That's a really good point. The, there's also, just talking about sentence structure, um, yeah, you, know, you guys probably remember, like in high school English, like they taught rhetorical devices, like onomatopoeia is the one everybody remembers. Yeah. Um, there's a whole list of rhetorical devices. Then you can search them online. You know, there are things like repeating the same phrase over and over um, through several sentences. Um, there's just a lot of different ways that you can structure structure the sentences so that they have a bigger impact. You can use um, Oh, I don't know. There's a, I can't think of any others right now. Conjunctive like, clauses. You know, yeah, like starting with starting with and you know anything that is bringing attention to this section of prose and saying this is really important, um, and using these techniques to kind of you don't want to use them in every scene, you don't want to use them in every line, but when you're really talking about a scene with a lot of tension. Um, playing with the word usage can really up the impact. And if you just do a Google search for rhetorical devices, you will find dozens and dozens of them. And unfortunately, most of us only learn like a handful in school, but there are so many really fun ones that you can use. Can, can you, um, Jay, do you have any other, like maybe an example of something you learned from uh, Margie that stands out in your mind, you know, when you think about that course? 
Well, she talked about rhetorical devices. She talked about doing the visceral emotion. Um, one of the things that she teaches is, and I actually do this, like um, she has a whole highlighter system where you highlight dialogue in a different color than action, in a different color than internalizations, description. And so you can basically lay out your chapter hmm. in front of you and see the balance of elements. Wow. So, for example, um, like yellow is the color she uses for internalizations. If you have a lot of yellow, that means that your pace is really slow because when you have big blocks of internalizations, nothing's happening. So if you have a scene that you you want to be very tense and your character stopping in the middle of it to have this long like soliloquy about how they're feeling, <laughs> I call it um, wool gathering. <laughs> yeah, wool gathering. You're gonna. You, it's really gonna slow down the pacing and the tension in the scene. And she actually also says that you should you know keep track of the tension in the scene so that you can. So it's a, it's just a different way of analyzing how you're structuring your scenes with the balance of dialogue. Um, you know. Uh, description uh if you know like if it's if it's if it's a scene with a lot of tension and you don't have any visceral emotion in it you're missing an opportunity so um yeah i i you know i can't teach her whole course she's you know just brilliant um but it's definitely worth a look she has tons of classes online you can order her lecture packets and things like that repeat her her last name margie lawson l-a-w-s-o-n I actually dedicated the book I just turned in to Margie because she made that much of a difference in my writing. Wow. Uh, I find myself wanting to say something about the like a long stretch of yellow there. Like, I, I think it is possible to have internal uh, an internalized section that has a lot of tension in it too. You know, if the character's really conflicted and going back and forth over something, like it may really have a lot of tension while developing that character too. So, I mean, I think it, that's a good general rule that you said like that. A lot of internal means nothing's happening, but sometimes you can make that work really well, too. Some of it depends on your genre as well. Um, For example, my husband reads a lot of, like, sword and sorcery stuff, and then he read my first urban fantasy, and he was like, you don't describe anything. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, you just kind of get in the scene, and she starts punching people. (laughs) um, That sounds awesome. It is. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but but then I realize that he's used to reading these like doorstopper novels where they you know they'll spend pages and pages and pages describing the room or describing the hilt of a sword or the, you know the banquet or you know whatever and so um, I think the switch in genre kind of threw him off because urban fantasy tends to be very fast paced more like a thriller or um, an action movie kind of pacing whereas he was used to reading kind of things that maybe took longer to describe so you're right i mean there are some instances where the internalizations can be full of tension if they're very well written and i think that well you know obviously we want everything to be well written right but um i think it's just one of those things of like look at it and if you're having too much of one color look at it and make sure that it needs all of that and that the other elements are balanced as well for That's me, great, with those with those large internalizations, I always try to break them up a little bit with action because if you think about what what is actually going on in the scene, even though your internalization paragraph that takes or, or maybe it's two pages of internalization or one page of internalization, even though that's happening at the speed of thought, because it takes the time the reader time to read to get through. Uh, form images in their mind and stuff like that. For them, it would it, it will have seemed like a fairly long time uh, amount of time has passed, even though in reality it's happening at the speed of thought. So for me, I always try to add some action, like some the character does something, they clench their fists in response to you know like a, a negative thought, or they sit down for a dramatic thought or whatever, and and that way just because you're breaking it up a little bit with action. Um, you still have the same amount of internalization, but it kind of it more closely matches the reader experience. So let's go ahead and go to closing thoughts. I'm going to go first to uh, Jordan this time. Great. Uh, one thing that we didn't really get a chance to talk too much about in this episode, but we have talked about in previous episodes, is the, um, I'm not sure exactly what this is called, but I call it the hook response pattern. So basically, I always have an unanswered question in my novel, at any point in my novel, there's always an unanswered question. So what I usually do is start with a hook, um, which is uh, a, a mystery or um, 
you know, refer to something that will happen later in the book, etc. And then, um, because I always want to have a hook going, at the start I'll have two hooks, and then after I introduce the second hook, I'll answer the first hook, right? So, um, an example of this is, uh, the stranger walked into the room, right? So, it's a stranger, it's very interesting, you want to find out more about the stranger, um, then I'll have maybe the main character, you know, Janie grabbed a gun, right? So that's that's another hook. It's 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 you, there's already conflict, right? And then I'll maybe answer who the stranger is. That you know, that the man and took off his mask and it was her dad. Hi, Janie. You know, like so so. There's always kind of like a hook. There's always something interesting that that guides the reader forwards, right? But then I, I don't keep them in suspense too long. Uh, at least long, not long enough for them to get frustrated, right? So it, I, I feel like if you can always have a hook outstanding, you can really pull a reader through your story. Yeah, I, I like this. I, I actually feel like uh, the more hooks you have in your story, the better. And I write, I write multiple points of view at this point. And so I feel like every character, you know, create, should create a hook. You know, every character creates, well, you know, what, how is this person going to resolve that issue they have? And how's this person going to do that thing? How's this, how's this thing? And then, and then like the book I'm writing now, there's, there's one like overarching hook, which is like this character has this vision earlier in the story of his brother being killed by a certain person. And you're waiting the whole book to see like what happens about that. But then there's also the mysteries in the story. Well, what, what was that God really talking about in the beginning of the book? And like, I feel like the more hooks you can put in the story, the more likely the people are to finish your story. So I'm a big, big proponent of like as many hooks as possible. And that one tool that you kind of referenced there where the um, reader is waiting for the whole novel to find out, that's called the uh, time bomb. I first heard that phrase from David Farland. Um, I'm sure you already know what that is, Moses, because you've taken a workshop from him, too. But uh, the key way to create tension is to have your protagonist working against the clock. Right? He's got to do X before Y happens, or Z is going to melt or sink into the sea or fly off into space or something. Um, the key there is that the clock has to be working for the antagonist. Uh, 24 is a really, really good example of this working well. Yeah. Can you think um, of any literary examples, Joshua? Well, I know that we've gotten that feedback that um, <laughs> we should not use as many uh, movie references, but I, I personally, I just don't agree with that. I mean, I know we're speaking to writers. We're talking about stories, and screenwriters and movies are just as uh, an important part of writing and storytelling as a book is. But I, I agree with the reader feedback in that we can use more literary, you know, comments, uh, references too. I mean, I guess another type of time bomb, which I have not used, but you see it in books and you see it in movies and such, you know, is the old thing where at the very beginning of the story you see the the climax moment, but you don't see the climax, and then you get to wait the whole book to read that. And I don't know, I, I to me that one's just so hitting you over the head with it uh, that I think that's not really something I'd want to use, but uh, but some people do that. I just used um, the time element in the book I just turned in, Cursed Moon, which is the second book of my new series. And um, the the timeline was, the, the premise of the story is what happens to a town full of magic users when a blue moon happens, and the blue moon sets everybody's magic, you know, to go really wonky. So I started the book on the new moon, and then the climax happens on the blue moon. So we knew the whole story that this this... The, like date is coming and everything just just go haywire that night. So um, you can it doesn't necessarily have to be a literal bomb, although there was a bomb in this particular book. So sorry, a blue moon well. is just the second full moon in a single month, right? Right. Yes, there's different definitions, but that's the accepted one. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I wanted to list one more, um, like I don't know, piece of advice, which is that um, you should not have any scenes in your book that don't have tension. Um, there's, if you have two people driving in a car and they're just having a happy talk about, you know, the weather, um, you're going to lose your reader. And so you're really trying to take your reader on almost an emotional roller coaster and the tension can ebb a little bit and then increase. I mean, um, but you really need to make sure that there's some form of tension, whether it's a conversation between two characters that are at odds or they're arguing about what to do next, or whether it is, you know, oh my God, a bomb's about to go off. There has to be, 
you know, differing levels, but it has to be in pretty much every scene, in my opinion. If you're having trouble with it, just throw in a zombie. There you go. I, I, I think maybe I, I, anytime I hear never do something, I'm always like, wait a minute, that can't be right. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to think, when would you want to write a scene that did not have any tension? And best thing I can come up with right now is maybe the very beginning. Yeah, no, that doesn't really work. No. I was going to say, the very beginning where you have the ordinary world that you're establishing, where everything is kind of hunky-dory, and then you have things that start. But then, you know, you, you can't start slow either. I mean, I, I have seen... I'm trying to think of how The Wheel of Time starts. I mean, the, there's not the prologue part, but the beginning of it is kind of like, oh, everything is cool in farm boy land. And it's, well, there's different it, kinds of tension. Right? And, and I mean, see, but that, that works, if I remember correctly, because it's a, he, what Robert Jordan, I think, did there is he really immersed the reader in, oh, it's happy pastoral farm boy land. It's fantasy. You love it. It's hugging you. You love reading fantasy. Oh, everything is so sweet and nice. And then stuff happens. No, he, uh, he started with Louis Theron. That's well, he right. started with, I said, not the prologue. Yeah, that was the yeah. prologue. So That's, the that, that was how we injected tension right at the very start. That's the time bomb, right? Yeah, that's the time bomb for the whole series. And, but also, like I said a second ago, there's different kinds of tension. It doesn't always have to be in your face like, you know, the world is going to explode if this doesn't happen right now. Tension for the beginning of a novel, especially of a big, huge, huge epic fantasy like that, could easily be um, uh, something like he's expecting his father to come into town and his father's not there yet, he's late. That can create tension for the characters. And if the characters are feeling tension, then that can inject tension to the reader as well. So, but there, there is a whole lot of not tension, if I recall correctly, not, not talking about the prologue, but the actual start of The Wheel of Time. Yeah. Because he, he's, again, immersing you in fantasy land. And it's, and it's very sweet and nice. And it's the beginning of the hero's journey where everything is normal and ordinary. So David, Eddings, know, that's, David Eddings has the same thing in Pawn of Prophecy. It's a huge series about Fangorm's farm. Sorry, a huge scene about Fangorm's farm, right? And mm-hmm. that that my you know my father couldn't get into that series at all. My father was a big fantasy reader, and I just stuck it out out of pure stubbornness. And then was introduced to this really good, awesome fantasy series. But I think you can do that at your own peril. Um, can we can we talk very quickly? I know that we're running out of time, but can we talk a little bit about flashbacks? Because sure. for, for me, they just murder tension. Right? I hate flashbacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I do too, right? Like, I, I, people use them. I've seen flashbacks within flashbacks within flashbacks, right? Yeah. And the thing to remember about flashbacks is because they happen in the past, there is zero tension, right? It's the exact same thing as, as writing a prequel, right? You, you, the characters need to start and end the flashback in the exact same place, right? Because it's mm-hmm. a flashback, right? So if you divert off into the past and something dramatic happens, your present-day character cannot change because <laughs> it was in the past. It, the, the actual action occurred before you even wrote the flashback. So yeah. for me, they just sap tension. Can anybody so think I, of yeah. flashbacks that work? Or? Yeah, I mean, see, I, I don't particularly write flashbacks that I can think of, but I mean, again, when I hear never, I'm like, that can't be right, because what if a flashback, you know, takes you into the scene where, you know, you've been wondering all book, why do these two people have this kind of issue? Did he do something to her? What happened? And then the, you go to the flashback, and it's slowly, uncomfortably unfolding, and you're figuring this out. Like, I, there's just got to be a way to do it where the... the flashback has tension in it. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, it can be an unfolding flashback, too. Like, there's a little piece here. You go through the novel. It gives you a little bit uh, an extra piece of the puzzle. You go through more of the present-day novel, then another little flashback uh, right. for, the, for a relationship like that, until finally that kind of culmination happens all at the same time at the um, ending of the story. Right. I used a flashback in one of my books where um, – Sabina Kane, my main character, walks into a murder scene, and it's pretty gruesome, um, but the image that she, it, it's, it's really staged, it's like an elaborate murder scene, um, and when she sees the body, it takes her immediately back to this time in her past where a very similar scene happened um, that set up a lot of her emotional arc for the book, and you know, I just did this brief, I don't know, like maybe one page flashback to the scene, which was pretty high tension in itself. And then it, you come back in and she has basically this huge emotional reaction because seeing that takes her back to this really emotional time in her life. And I think it worked because it really deepened 
her emotional arc, but um, I use them very sparingly and only if I think it's going to explain a character's reaction to something that's happening, you know, in, in the present. Yeah, yeah, so what you said... I think I'm sorry. I think that's valid to you know also have to have those flashbacks that are developing the characters, deepening the characters. If you can add attention to them, even better. But yeah, that that's I think that's valid. Also, what you said, Jay, you did it a single page. You were in and out. Uh huh. That's important. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Okay, uh, Joshua. Any fun? I think we did get some final thoughts from Jay. Is that right? Yeah. No, Jordan. We'll go to we'll go to Joshua then. Okay. Um. Uh, just a couple extra. Um, techniques that you can use to create tension. Um, if you can... Okay, don't make things easy for your protagonist. If you're unpredictable, um, then the hero is going to be unbalanced. He's going to be off balance because he can't trust anything that's going around, uh, on around him. Uh, then if he can't trust anything, then your readers can't either. I mean, every step is going to be questioned. And um, you could and should, each step could uh, come at a great cost. So, a book that does that really well is uh, a book, Jordan, that uh, does that really well is Charlie Houston's Caught Stealing. I mean, the whole trilogy is really just a roller coaster and high tension, keeps you turning those pages. Um, when doing this, I would also consider making things tough for the antagonist, because uh, if you raise the stakes for the antagonist as well, then he's going to be getting meaner and getting badder and getting more vicious, which in turn makes the hero have to be more heroic in order to deal, to deal with that escalation. Um, another tool is to make it, uh, to, to give your, t- to throw a lose-lose situation at your protagonist. <clears throat> So have your antagonist present choices to the protagonist that seem like no matter what he chooses, he's going to lose something. Um, like Sophie's Choice. Great example. Uh, alternatively, I have the hero figure out a creative and unforeseen workaround so that there's a third uh, like hidden secret choice. Um, but it doesn't have to be a life or death choice if you get your reader sufficiently emotionally involved in the character. I mean, uh, maybe the character is a recovering alcoholic. And... Uh, when he's drinking, his life is complete crap and he ruins everything, but the villain does something so terrible that it strains the hero's ability to keep from drinking. You know, that kind of tension can work really well, too, and keep readers glued to the page. And then the last thing, uh, because I know that everybody's gritting their teeth at me right now, is... uh, Give your character more things to do than he can handle. Make sure that, you know, he's trying to keep all the balls in the air uh, and that you know that it's taking everything that that protagonist has to do that. And if he drops one, you know, then all kinds of bad things happen. Uh, Just making your readers wait and anticipate one of those balls falling will create a lot of tension. Yeah, so my final thoughts, don't be afraid... Don't be afraid to put your readers through hell. Don't be afraid to put your characters through hell. Like, don't don't feel like you have to be a softie, right? Like, uh, David Farland, one of his kind of theories on why we read fiction, I think, is so that we kind of experience traumatic, intense things from a safe place, and our brain can process it in, in a safe way. And, and you know, if you're pulling punches, like, stop. <laughs> you know, start, start punching and... and um, you know, I mean, you can overdo anything, but, you know, definitely don't be afraid to, to put the reader and the characters through hell. And uh, I, I want to just go back to just one of my favorite points that I already said, which is just it, hooks, 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 hooks. Like, there should be, I just feel like you should be putting hooks in your readers as often as you possibly can. Like, uh, there's a mystery. Like, okay, what's that all about? Or, oh, this character has this this desire, and, and now we care about this character. Are they going to get to fulfill that desire? Are they going to succeed? Are they going to fail? Um, Jordan mentioned the uh, point about, you know, you, you give the reader knowledge, but the character doesn't know it, and that also creates tension. That's a hook. Oh, well, what's going to happen when the, re- when the character finds out there's uh, a big snuggly wumpus in the, um, uh, you know, basement? And Oh, God, a wumpus? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, it, romance. How is the romance going to work out? And, oh, is this person going to reveal that big secret that they have? And, oh, wait, what is that secret that they're holding? And, oh, oh, the end of the chapter hinted at something. Oh, wait a minute, what's going to happen next? Like, you should be hooking people constantly because... That's that's your biggest task is to get the person to finish the book, you know. And and the more hooks you have, the more likely they are to finish the book. 
and hopefully you have a great ending, and then they're going to love the book, and then you're going to have a career. So, We should have called this episode Hooking and Punching. Again. <laughs> 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 so uh, I think we've, we've chatted enough for one week, and uh, we one, will... One note, one note, Moses. Something that sure. you said um, when you first started your, your final thought there sure. um, made me realize that an important part of creating tension is also relieving tension. So, I mean, just as important as building up tension is allowing your readers to take a break from all that tension. Because if you hit them too hard, they're not going to be able to continue reading. They're going to have to put the book down and, and shake it off. Because uh, there, there is a threshold that you shouldn't cross. And a good author knows when that threshold is and will insert something to relieve that tension for a bit. Like... Um, going into a little bit of humor. Uh, it's called defeating reader expectations. So a good way to uh, acclimatize your readers to a higher level of tension is by injecting um, a little bit of humor or just changing the emotional beat. It's like climbing a really tall mountain um, where you have to stop and get used to the elevation before going higher. So, for example, in a scary story, you could have a bunch of horror and mystery beats and then give your readers a moment to relax with a couple beats of humor. I mean, you see all kinds of stories do this in, in movies. Then you hit them with the unexpected shark in the face and you kill off one of the MCs. So not only does the, the rest of, uh, the, not only does that rest allow your readers to regroup and sort of recuperate, but it allows your next beat of horror to hit even harder. Very good. Okay, I think we're done for this week. We will be back next week. Look forward to catching up with you guys then. This has been another episode of Hide and Create. The show is produced by me, Jordan Ellinger. The site is edited by Joshua Esso, and my co-hosts have been Jay Wells and Moses Surigo. That music that you're listening to was written by Jason Donnelly. We can be reached at writingpodcastonline.com, where you can ask us questions or suggest topics for future shows. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider reviewing us on iTunes, liking our Facebook page, or subscribing to the Hide and Create YouTube channel. That's all for now. Now go hide and create something.